Hi, thank you for tuning in to this um, virtual keynote. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizers that they're still making a little bit of an event available. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to share our ongoing work on computationally tracing concepts through time and space. Um, I thought it would, might be nice to, uh, to present some work in progress. Um, so the next year, hopefully, when we get to see each other um, in, in real life, um, that we can discuss this further and uh, that I can present the follow-up work in some way. Um, so just a bit of an overview of this talk. It seems like a lot, but the sections are quite short. Um, so I give a little bit of context about uh, big text data and humanities, or at least how, how we um, at the Digital Humanities Lab in Amsterdam um, go about uh, dealing with this. Um, then how do we trace concepts? So what are the kind of use cases we're working on? Um, I'd like to present some, some recent work on entity spaces um some new horizons and and finally a, a wrap up and uh, that i'm sure I'll, I'll be out of time so big data and humanities um i don't think this is going to be any news to you um but there are so many digitized archives now and they're enabling all types of new research um it, it's amazing. Every time I go into Twitter, um, I see an example of some amazing new research being done with some data set that has been made available. Um, this weekend I was reading the newspaper um, and a journalist had used the uh, Verkaufsbucher, which are um, uh, the books that uh, uh, recorded uh, houses of Jews during the Second World War uh, being sold. Um, so the city, uh, cities have been uh, keeping those books and um, those have been digitized by the Dutch National Archive and they just created a map of, of all the uh, houses that were sold. Um, so, you know, loads of people are doing this and, and loads of research is like probably most of, of you. Um, some of the data sets that, um, uh, that we've been using uh, partly for this research uh, and also for a whole bunch of other projects. Um, if you don't know about them, I definitely invite you to have a look at them. Uh, the Dutch National Library has over 100 million newspaper, book and magazine pages digitized. Um, everyone can, can look at them. Uh, they, they, they have a web portal. Um, and for research purposes, you have access to, uh, to them as well. Uh, Chronicle America uh, from the US Library of Congress um, newspaper pages, you can also query them via an API. Um, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France has a similar setup. Uh, their APIs are slightly different. Um, here in Amsterdam, uh, we have the Amsterdam City Archives. They have many different sources, but for example, they have 160,000 notary deeds um, from the early modern period. So one of the things we're doing right now, for example, is um, uh, uh, we, we're collecting them to the records of the Dutch East India Company to see if we can actually build the, the networks of these people in the early modern period. So the people who would um, uh, become crew members on the ships of the Dutch East India Company, they would go to a notary um, to get some, some, uh, some of their um, finances arranged uh, and we would have uh, the notary files have been digitized. Actually, names uh, have been uh, annotated in there by hand. Um, and then for the Dutch East India Company, we also have the, um, the records of who uh, uh, worked on what ship, in what rank, how much did they make. Um, and this is part of a bigger project on maritime careers. So we try to, to connect these kinds of um, different sources about the same people, about the same locations, in order to, to get a better overview of, of who these people were, what they did. Um, and also, you know, in Luxembourg, uh, there's been, I know, some, some really nice projects going on uh, with newspapers. Um, there's 800,000 pages 
there as well. Uh, and I'm sure that if you think of, uh, of your, or your archives, your, your specific locale, uh, there's much more going on. But the problem is that um, in most cases, this is text and you need to do something with it in order to be able to analyze it. Now, um, traditionally in humanities, uh, there's you know, qualitative methods, um, very much looking at an individual record or page. Um, now we can do that digitally. So it used to be the case, you would actually go to an archive, you get this box of letters, of books, you would go through them and very careful reading, seeing what's in there. Um, we have quantitative methods. One of the, uh, so, so, you know, we can use the computer. One of the uh, criticisms often is that it's shallow. So uh, we started scratching the surface, but um, especially in the beginning, I mean, we had to come from somewhere. Looking at text, uh, the field of computational linguistics have been going, has been going strong for about five decades. Um, but we don't have a full deep understanding of human language. Um, however, it's 2020 now and our technology is definitely getting better. So we can do more. Um, it's not easy, it's not trivial, it's still research. Um, but this is partly what, uh, no, this is what my group is, is working on. Uh, and with my group, many, many other groups as well. So what we try to do is, uh, we try to bridge the gap between quantitative and qualitative analyses by using uh, natural language processing and semantic web technologies. Um, and it's, it's really complementary. So these, these two things are not, uh, not exclusive. So it's, 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 a, it, it, it's a bit of a dance um so some steps of our, our research are uh automatic we use automatic methods um but they can pinpoint really really interesting bits in the data to look at and then maybe you have to look at them um the old-fashioned way um or you you use some of the technology to select things and then we have to bring in another piece of technology or do some some extra research actually that's mostly the case um, in order to do that fine-grained analysis on these particular instances of the data. Um, and by that constant zooming in, zooming out, um, switching between um, uh, close reading, uh, distant reading, uh, zooming in and zooming out, uh, we get a better understanding of the data and hopefully also of the concepts we are trying to analyze. Um, so the, the two uh, pieces of research, uh, three pieces of research I want to present are um, from three different papers. Um, two papers have been recently published. One of them is, uh, we're still working on it. So you see at the, the top or sometimes at the bottom uh, where this research, uh, uh, for, from which paper this, um, this comes. Um, so this was a um, paper that we recently presented at the workshop on humanities and semantic web with uh, some colleagues from Germany, uh, where we tr really tried to uh, s look at the interplay between natural language processing and knowledge graphs. Uh, I'll explain knowledge graphs in, in a little bit. Um, for, for humanities and, and see what the challenges are. So this was a position paper, we've done some data analysis. Um, so in digital humanities or in humanities, really, we want to um, understand cultural heritage data. Um, and we see more and more that these techniques um, are becoming used there. Um, now, one of the use cases we had in that paper, and that's also another uh, a piece of work we're working on is who's the biggest sweet tooth. So um, sugar consumption, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going a little bit from here and there, but it all, it all comes together in a bit, I promise. Um, 
so cultural data, it tells us something about what people did. How did they lead their lives, right? Uh, one of the things they, uh, one of the things that is interesting is what people ate. Now that is interesting from a dietary perspective, from a health perspective, um, but it's very, it's very difficult to trace these. Uh, so traditionally, socioeconomic historians, um, they have data about uh, how much sugar was imported or exported, um, but uh, we don't know how much people actually ate. Like we can't go to a shop or go to people's household and look in their cabinet uh, or in their shopping cart and see how much sugar they bought, right? Or throw them in a lab and, and, and measure everything what they do. So um, we are thinking that we could use historical alpha recipes as a proxy. Um, so recipes, uh, we would assume, uh, especially if we choose them well, uh, this that we look at, um, that um, uh, these were things people cooked. Now, of course, you know, you may cook a little, you may use a little bit less, but if you um, analyze loads and loads of recipes, you, you will get trends. So that might tell us something about sugar consumption patterns. Um, apple pie, because apple pie is fun, but also apple pastries are very common in many cultures because um, you can grow apples uh, in many places. Um, they're not as uh, finicky as um, uh, cherries or, or peaches uh, that just grow in a few places. They just need more sun um, and have a shorter season. So, so we thought that might be uh, an interesting case to look at. Um, let me just make sure that my timer is still on so I don't get into trouble. Yeah, there we go. Um, yes, analyzing historical recipes. Now, if you look at um, current recipes that you might find online, um, they're actually already structured most of the times. Very often you also see um, first a list of ingredients with the quantities. Um, if it's, for example, a website of a supermarket, you might be able to actually click on them and just add it automatically to your shopping list. Um, actually, if you look into the website source, very often the uh, the ingredients are actually structured like a database uh, that facilitates, for example, search like give me all the desserts that have apple in them. Um, this is another case for for historical recipes. So uh, what you see in the image is uh, one of the oldest uh, apple pie recipes. Um, I think this is a. F mm, I've kind of forgot the year of this, I should know this. I'll make a note of this and I'll add it to the presentation when I put it online. Um, actually, this one doesn't have sugar in it, um, but it does have spices and figs and pears, um, saffron, and it's uh, baked in coffin pastry. So you didn't eat the pastry, but it was sort of more of a vessel, I've been told. Um, makes it a bit harder to analyze this. Uh, so we actually chose to only look at apple pie recipes uh, from the 1850s on. Also because that is when sugar became uh, more common for the people to, to eat. Before that, it was really only for the, for, for the, for the elite. Um, now, when we go actually to these resources, and I already told you a little bit about that when I listed like what the Dutch National Library has, uh, a Chronicle in America, um, there's definitely differences in availability of digitized sources. So even though there's a lot out there, when you start working with it, you run into all sorts of issues. Um, sometimes uh, you, can, you can download an actual, uh, just an article. Sometimes you can only download the entire page. Um, sometimes you can't download it at all, um, or it's behind a paywall because, for example, a library has digitized all these things in collaboration with these companies. Um, so there's definitely work to do there. 
still. Um, and I think only if we, as researchers, push for getting these resources made available for our research um, when we write project proposals, try to get one of those institutes on board um, as part of the project uh, to really improve that infrastructure that's going to help us all in the long run. Um, it's sometimes also just really hard to digitize uh, these things, um, especially, you know, you do big quantities, um, maybe the ink is, is uh, a, a, you know, a, a bit um, blotchy. Um, it's really, really difficult to do. There's folds in the paper. It's really difficult to do uh, this without having any artifacts from the digitization project, uh, uh, process. So um, there might be OCR errors in there. Um, there might be other kind of weird things in there. So a lot of my work is trying to take the, the techniques from computational linguistics that have been developed for um, uh, nice, clean, digital born text and see what happens when you, for example, apply them to these digitized real data. Um, and then, you know, you just have to uh, have to be creative and uh, you, a lot of the things don't just work out of the box. Um, normalization of quantities. Um, we didn't always use kilograms and liters. Uh, actually, lots of places still don't. So um, that's something we also have to take into account. Um, so that's really a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, unless you you really try to create something that that like that does fully understand like fully understand um, these recipes, uh, which is you know you could probably spend a couple of PhD projects on it. So if anyone is interested, um, we really try to see what can we do now with the technology we have, um, and that's already quite a lot. Um, but it is still an interplay between. Um, the, the domain expert and, uh, and the machine. So, so one of the things we did was uh, we first started looking at, uh, with my colleagues in Germany, looking at ingredients in Dutch and American apple pie recipes. Um, so the blue ones are the Dutch ones and the red ones are the, the United States uh, ones. Uh, the x-axis is um, the years, so the, the publication year, and um, uh, every dot is an ingredient that we found, uh, and we just highlighted some of them um, on the y-axis there. So most recipes contain apples. That's good, because we're looking at apple pie recipes. Um, some Dutch recipes contain raisins, which we don't find in the American recipes. Uh, there's some salt in there as well. Um, Americans have baking mix um, and some tartaric acid. I'll get to that in the next slide. Um, what's interesting here is to do these kind of comparisons, you don't always have data from the same time period or, or there might be other differences there. So you can't just do statistic analysis. So it's, it's really meant to help the exploratory process. And here what we thought about, well, you know, what is an apple pie? What is in an apple pie? Well, you know, the title says apple, so... Um, we found this in an American newspaper that says, what? No apples. Um, and this is, uh, you get a big crust, you use soda crackers, so it's also not making a dough yourself. Um, you, you, I mean, it, it, is, it is a fairly common way of making a pie crust, I guess, to get uh, crackers or, or biscuits and add butter. Um, and then they add sugar, and cream of tartar, which is tartaric acid. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, digging into the kind of recipes uh, from, from this time, the recipes that don't have apples, 
um, during uh, economic downturns, uh, there were these sort of cheap ways of getting desserts or these recipes published in newspapers. So, so we thought that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, and uh, zooming out, uh, just to go to quantities, we looked at Dutch, American, French, um, and German recipes. And we really see major differences between the sugar quantities. Um, so the orange ones, those are the Dutch ones. Uh, the green ones are the Americans. Uh, the, the lines are the standard deviations. So it's really, but you sort of see that the American recipes are uh, a bit more sugar most of the time. Um, and then the German recipes uh, and the Dutch recipes that cluster there in the end are contemporary recipes from recipe websites. And then also we sort of see the patterns that the Germans are bigger sweeties. Um, but it's incredibly difficult because you sort of see like, hey, all this data is available and then you start looking at it and, and it's really, oh, but, you know, these are older, there is much more, um, you have to do all sorts of filtering, uh, every data set has their own uh, way of accessing it, so this makes this kind of analysis quite difficult, but still quite interesting to start looking at. So this is work in progress, hopefully next year I can tell you who actually is the biggest sweet tooth. Uh, but just to give you an insight into, into how we go about these things. Um, you know, going back to this recipe, if, if, you know, if you ask me what's in an apple pie, it's like, well, apple, flour, sugar, um, those are sort of the basics. And then you can add cinnamon or raisins. So that's a Dutch thing. Maybe not everyone likes that. Um, but then you get this recipe that says apple pie without apple, right? So, um, what is uh, an apple pie and uh, how can we capture this in, for example, um, a resource, a knowledge graph, or a database, if you will? Um, because, you know, the very first apple pie recipe with the coffin uh, dough um, didn't have sugar in it. And then I had another recipe that actually didn't have apple in it. So where does apple pie begin and end? Is it, you know, if I call it an apple pie, it's an apple pie? Um, I'm just going to see if I can. Um, so what may be true in one context is, is maybe not true in another context. Um, and then, you know, concept evolves. So, you know, we sort of saw a trend like there's, there's different uses of, of sugar in uh, different quantities of sugar in these recipes. So how do we go about that? And how can we store all this information such that we can reuse it? Um, yeah. Like, is apple strudel an apple pie or not? Um, maybe this is something to weigh in on during the Slack discussion afterwards. Uh, I've been told that uh, Austrians would be quite offended if you say apple strudel is the same as apple pie, but I don't know. Um, for this kind of analysis, would it matter? Um, if you just want a good dessert, does it matter? Um, so one of the big questions that, that we're working on is how can we store this type of information uh, at scale? And uh, modeling of concepts uh, currently falls into the realm of knowledge representation of semantic web, which is a research domain um, uh, that, um, for example, Tim Berners-Lee, who uh, kind of, uh, created the, the World Wide Web, was, uh, is, is to the part of. Um, and the goal is to have machine readable knowledge. Now, this has a very, very long history. Um, uh, you know, anyone who's done any logic or, or philosophy, um, you know, these kind of things like uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. 
um, that's all, you know, uh, ingrained in this in this research domain. And, and we've been trying to actually make computers reason with this kind of stuff. And then we see that um, it, it works up to a certain extent, especially if we have um, uh, if we do it in within a, a closed domain. So so. Um, you know, for uh, I don't know train time train timetables. You know, we can you know map all the concepts, but as soon as you go into the real world, um, uh, it becomes harder and harder. Nonetheless, we have uh, several large scale knowledge graphs such as Wikipedia and Wikipedia, uh, Wikidata. Sorry, uh, so Wikidata is a database that powers Wikipedia. And DBpedia is actually derived from the info boxes from, from Wikipedia, and that's just you know your computer can, um, can can read these kind of things. Uh, we have all these graphs, which which you could say are networks. Um, you can also use network uh, statistics on these graphs, um, graph structure databases um, that are being used in in loads of applications. So companies are using them. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, we have some small semantic web companies that also do things for cities, um, like the Dutch Cadaster. Um, Google is using it, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook. Um, it's there, but it's under the under the bonnet, so you don't really see it. Although, if you if you Google something like uh, Amsterdam, uh, you get this uh, info box on the right in your search results. Well, that is powered by semantic web technology. Uh, so really, there's there's a lot um, there, and and it's it's a very useful tool. So so this is something that at Humanities Cluster uh, we're actively uh, engaging with, actively working on improving. Um, so a knowledge graph is one of these networks of uh, of things, and it represents what we consider true about parts of the world, you know, because we can't model the entire world um, and they're created and, and maintained continuously by all sorts of, sorts of people but there's definitely some some challenges uh, because they're often static so they're snapshots of the world now we there are uh, there is a lot of research to um, to automatically update them um, but um, it's just incredibly hard. Uh, fuzziness, fluidity of concepts. Um, so uh, there isn't that much about uh, the historical dimension yet. Um, uh, in, in DBpedia, for example, um, I think if you go to the page on Arnold Schwarzenegger, it just says he's an actor. Well, he's also a politician. Um, he was a, an athlete at some point, um, and that's just uh, one person who's done various things, right? Um, so how do we go about about these concepts? So you could say that that certain people are concepts, but also uh, we have many more more complex things that we would like to do something with in a database that we want to store somehow. All the knowledge that we as humanities researchers are, are working on, are studying, um, and that we maybe write down in, again, non-machine readable text. How do we go about that? So that's all documented in photographs, newspapers, books, and, and books. So how can we actually make this understandable to a computer so that we can do an app, you know, all sorts of analyses with it and that we can preserve um, our analyses a bit better. Um, so one of the things we want to do is, is distinguish the spatio-temporal metadata. And I think that's also a very, very interesting thing for um, computational linguistics, is that it looks very much at the text um, and not so much at the metadata. So the fact that this comes from a cookbook from a particular time period, or that the title says this is a French recipe. Uh, we need to use that. So, you know, the fact that it's an American cookbook, but it says in it's it's a French recipe, those contexts, we need to store both of them in our database um, so that we can actually say something about how this evolved over a particular geographic region. The fact that it is 
that a French recipe is recorded in an American recipe says some in an American recipe book says something about the interest of the Americans in French recipes. Units. Ugh. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And it's luckily there's loads and loads of databases um, that you can use to convert um, a lot of these things. Um, but what do you do with uh, a sniff of pepper, uh, a load of butter, or a plate of apples? Those are things you we cannot automate yet. Um, so if you really want to analyze these things, this is very specific for recipes and doesn't hold for other kinds of um, analyses, but um, every domain you will find things that um, require a domain expert. You, you would have to go and, and, and check with cooks. It's like when I try to replicate my grandma's apple pie recipe, she says, ah, oh, this is how I do it, and it always tastes different from when she does it. So um, there, we're just going to have to accept that we can do everything automatically. We can't, there, there's a limit to that. Um, but thankfully, we, uh, we, can, we can convert loads of things already. Um, but the, the, the big question is, um, what is the core of a concept? So how broad or narrow should an ontology be modeled? to fit a concept. So, um, so what are the properties that actually uh, belong to their central, that, that really make an apple pie? And without those things, it's not an apple pie. And where do you say, well, this is, this is the apple pie, and this is not apple pie? Um, and I think that's, that's a really big question for, for knowledge representation. Something to think about, I'm not sure we can solve it. Um, and then I think one of the things that we've been doing so far is really these um, smaller domain specific knowledge graphs, which, which is a good way to go about it. But um, if you look at the linked open data cloud now, which is all these different knowledge graphs that are connected together, there's thousands of, of them and um, that becomes unworkable too. Um, so uh, there's, there's a balance there. Uh, how much can you put in one, one knowledge graph and when do you have to go to two separate ones? Um, so, so one of the things we, we think could be useful here, and this is a proof of concept that we've uh, published recently uh, in collaboration with a colleague from uh, the University of Amsterdam, is entity spaces. Um, and that's really to try to, to uh, bring some of that uh, fluidity of concepts into uh, a representation. So, um, you know, uh, language is incredibly flexible and efficient. Uh, you know, uh, we can use the term sugar to refer to the sugar industry particular instance of sugar, shall I put some sugar in if you have a cup of tea and someone asks if you, if you want some sugar. Nutritional information like measuring someone's sugar and fiber intake. Um, commodities, sugar and grain are produced in these and these regions. Um, it's all the same word. And, and this goes for a lot of concepts. Um, in the paper you find some instances of uh, the word Germany, which is used for example uh, uh, to refer to the agricultural thing, it can be used to the football team, it can be used to refer to the Davis Cup team, uh, but then in a particular year, of course, the football team or the Davis Cup team consists of different people, and for different kinds of use cases, you might actually need to know who these people were. So how can computers make sense of this at all, right? Um, so what we came up with is until we have uh, created this structure where we can um, create these really complex uh, entities, we, we can start using um, and these entity spaces. We think the proxy could be um, that Wikipedia disambiguation page. Um, 
actually if you were to scroll down you can see loads of different like this there's, there's a nickname like someone would call someone sugar is uh is called someone uh, a nice person uh maybe a bit derogatory but in terms of you know it's all it's all uh contextual um it can also be all sorts of other things like big sugar is the uh the sugar industry right um so we use this to say you know if we don't know which exact meaning of the word sugar or germany or whatever is is uh, used uh, and we want to say connect a text to a database entry uh, so that we can use it it's better to link to something even if this is maybe this space that is not completely uh, defined yet then it is to um, uh, not link at all which is what is happening now in a lot of systems so this is really where we try to improve um, uh, entity linking. So, so going from a text to connect it to uh, some resource, some dictionary entry or encyclopedia entry. So we call that tolerant entity linking. Um, if we don't have every entity or concept represented, uh, we try to come up with a good enough interpretation. So we sort of know what it is, but not specifically. Uh, and our proof of concept shows that we can increase the recall uh, from the 13 data sets we tested on for eight of them. Um, now, this, is, well, this was only a proof of concept, um, but this is really uh, what, what I'm currently working on. Um, so we want to extend this, of course, beyond Wikipedia because this was a proxy, but if we can make these better and especially add the historical dimension, um, that would be very useful. Um, now also, we want to bring some more structure into these entity space, like how do these things relate to each other, um, the temporal and historical dimension. Intangible concepts, that's very, very high on the list. For example, uh, sense. Um, is one, one thing we're working on now. I'll be happy to tell you more about that um, some other time. Um, and things like violence uh, or democracy, because those have changed over time as well, but they're sort of, you know, what is it? Like, you know, sugar is sort of a unit. You can point at it like a lump of sugar, uh, but these things you can't really uh, point at. And of course, scaling up to, to different use cases. Um, I'm wrapping up. My time is, is kind of up, but I'm wrapping up. Um, the way we go about it is, is really recognizing that this, is, this needs to be teamwork because you really go beyond a single discipline um, to try to recognize and model and then use these concepts. Um, the way we go about this uh, at the Humanities Cluster is um, actually when we first started my research group almost three years ago, we, we just did a big tour and we created a network of all the people in our institute and their interests and the kind of data sets that they work together with. And that has actually resulted in the kind of collaborations that I told about that I told you about, like none of these use cases uh, were done individually. Uh, and we've got several different constellations of people working on different topics together, um, spanning institutes uh, and different research departments. Um, so that is something that um, uh, I hope to inspire you to do as well, is, is use your network. Um, there because that different perspective on a particular concept really opens it up um, and will provide a new way of, of looking at your data. Uh, so just to wrap up, um, text analysis and knowledge representation are becoming more important to humanities research. Um, there are definitely big challenges in, in you know, what technology can do, what we've done so far and where we, we want to go. Um, and we try to approach it in interdis interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, yeah, so some uh, big thanks to um, 
researchers in my group, researchers elsewhere. Um, the summer school that, uh, where we started part of this is research. Um, when we can travel again, come visit us in Amsterdam. And um, thank you for listening if you're still here at the end of this. <laughs>